Hello, my name is Karen Patterson from the Rowallan and Slave Group Community Twinning Group. We believe passionately in local history projects and we have commissioned a series of online lectures by historian Horace Reid. Horace has been researching our local history in County Down since 1990. Horace presents regularly to local historical societies and publishes in local newspapers. Over the years, he has compiled a wide variety of highly illustrated slideshows. We are grateful for the support from Nuriam Warren and Down District Council for this important historical project. I shall now hand over to Horace to introduce the presentation. This is Old Mohardrol Parish Church uh, on top of Crabtree Hill, about a mile outside Balnehinch. It's a medieval foundation uh, created uh, about uh, 1300 uh, in pre-Reformation times. Balnehinch that we know uh, was founded about 1660. So before that date, uh, this church here was the civic center uh, for the Balnehinch area. This is where you had all the baptisms, all, all, all the funerals, uh, all the weddings. Now the parish church <coughs> was transferred uh, down to Church Street in Balnehinch about uh, 1770. Uh, so that meant that uh, 400 years of Balnehinch history were left stranded up here. So what I want to do is go back uh, to the 1300s and then advance through four centuries to about 1770 and, and let you know about the early history of Balnehinch, uh, Protestant and Catholic, as it is recorded in the tombstones in this cemetery. Go ahead. Now, needless to say, uh, Balnage today is quite different uh, to what it was uh, 400 years ago. Um, there was a time when Balnage was just a crossroads, uh, just, just a village. And the sole church for the town wasn't in the town. It was a mile or a mile and a half outside Balnage, uh, up a steep, narrow road uh, on, the, on the top of Crabtree Hill. Uh, so we have modern day Mockerdrill Parish Church on Church Street in Balnehinch, but uh, there, there existed an older church called Old Mockerdrill uh, on, on Crabtree Hill. So that was the parish church for the town uh, <coughs> for uh, uh, 400 odd years, <coughs> uh, from 1306 to 1772, and it was a parish church for both denominations. Uh, uh, Catholic and Protestants. So if we go up to Old Mockerdrill, uh, it, it was the, uh, if there was no church in Balnehinch, then the civic centre or one of the civic centres for the town was on Crabtree Hill. That's where you had your weddings, that's where you had your funerals, that's where you had your baptisms, and that's where you went to, to Sunday worship. So if we want to know the history uh, of the of the uh, of the town from the 1300s uh, to the 1600s, then uh, we should go up uh, to Old Mockerdrill and take a look at the headstones. And the headstones tell you the people that were buried there, the people that were in the town at the time, and this this uncovers our earlier history. So first first of all, where is Old Mockerdrill? If you drive uh, down um, <clears throat> the church road, down to Mill Bridge, then there are, there's a junction with uh, f f four roads coming out of it. So the left-hand junction goes to Spa, the right-hand junction goes to da down Patrick, the road up the middle goes to Newcastle, and then, then if you look carefully, you see another little road, and that's Crabtree Road, up a steep hill, and uh, then on top of the steep hill, uh, is Old, is old Mockard Road Church. So if you are ever at the Millbrook Lodge Hotel, uh, look out the front door, you're looking up a hill and Old Mockard Road is up at the top of that hill. Looking more closely, <coughs> uh, the left-hand picture shows you Crabtree Road at the bottom. 
Then the yellow bar is the lane uh, which runs off Crabtree Road beside an electricity substation. And then uh, there is uh, Old Mother Draw at, at the end of the lane. When you see a circle of trees uh, on top of a hill and a church in the middle, that tells you automatically that this is a medieval church with a, a, a very long history. Uh, Mockerdroll, uh, the translation is the plain between the two forks. So I'm not quite sure what two forks they're talking about. However, if you go out to Downpatrick Road, and there are a couple of, of uh, sharp bends uh, fairly soon out of Downpatrick Road, and on those bends, uh, there's the Balnenge River and a couple of bends in it. So, uh, and then ab above the, the river, uh, up the steep hill, is Old, old Mother Droll. So that, that might be the, the, the plain and, and the two forks uh, that, that is, is being referred to. Now, <clears throat> the church um, is first recorded in history in 1306. Uh, every year, uh, uh, every so often, the uh, existing Pope asked for all his churches to be taxed. Uh, so Mahadrol is mentioned in the taxation of Pope Clement V in 1306. Now Martin Luther and Protestantism didn't come along to 1517, so necessarily then uh, old Mahadrol start, started off uh, as a Catholic foundation. Um, <clears throat> the, church, the town as we recognise it now um, came into existence uh, when the Rodens uh, arrived in Balnench and acquired ownership. So um, Sir, Sir, Sir George Rodden acquired ownership about 1660. Uh, Sir John Rodden then made Balnench his uh, residence, uh, 1760. And it was only after 1760 that the Rodens took a serious interest in the town. Uh, they founded the market house, <coughs> uh, they founded Montalto. You got an outbreak of uh, church building then. Uh, First Presbyterian uh, was built 1751. Uh, second, uh, pre pre the present se uh, Second Presbyterian, uh, 1840. Uh, St. Patrick's, 1870. The Methodist, 1856. But previous to that, uh, there, was, there weren't any churches in the town. The, the church, the sole church, uh, was up at Old Mockadrol. So uh, what the Rodens did was they moved the civic centre uh, from Old, Old, Old Mockadrol uh, down into uh, Balnange proper and transformed the town and laid out new, new streets. But before that, uh, Old Mockadrol was dominant. So I'm going to look at the 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 450 years prior to the Rodens arriving and prior to the, the, the trans transformation of Balnange. So I'm going to look at the pre-plantation and the plantation pe uh, period, uh, which is a pretty stormy history. Uh, <clears throat> in that period, uh, the McCartans uh, owned uh, Kinlarty. Uh, and, and they, they were the uh, dominant family. They were al allied with the McGuinnesses. Uh, so the McCartans uh, had the area around Balnage, Kinlarty, and the McGuinnesses had the area around the Mourns uh, down to Ross River, and that was Ivy. This map here is, is lying on its ear, uh, so that uh, north is to the right, uh, Belfast, uh, uh, Belfast Loch, Carrick Fergus and Bangor. But uh, there, there you have the McCartans uh, marked uh, in central, central County Down. So if they uh, owned Kinlarty, then uh, they exercised control over Old Mahardroll Church. They also had a, they, their, headqu their headquarters uh, was at Logan Island. Uh, on Castle Island, <clears throat> and they also had a collection of churches in uh, Lochan Island, uh, the McCartan churches. And uh, their allies, the McGuinnesses, uh, they had uh, some members of their clan buried in Old Mockardrol. We're told that in, in Lewis's Topographic Dictionary uh, in 1837. 
Uh, <coughs> I was looking in Old Mocker Drove for the oldest uh, tombstones, and I can't see anything that would, that would resemble a McGuinness one. Uh, there are some very old ones, but not the ornate McGuinness ones I'd be expecting. That's a, that's a McGuinness tombstone on the left, uh, but it's not in Balnehinch. It's in uh, 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 Drum Bally Roney uh, near Rath Ryland. Uh, the archaeologists have had a look at Old Mocker Draw and, and they say, uh, okay, it was uh, in operation in the 1300s, but it was rebuilt uh, in the 1400s and uh, 1500s. So the, the walls that you see when, when you go up there, uh, that's them outlined in black. But then it was renovated, they say, in 1607. And the renovations I have marked in red and this date of uh, 1607 is um, very interesting and worth dis discussing. There's a record of some of the clergy uh, who were there uh, in 1400 and uh, 1444. So um, the, the, the church is mentioned in the Archaeological Survey of County Down, published 1966, seen top right, and a lot of detail about it. In, in the Ecclesiastical Antiquities of uh, Down and Connor <coughs> uh, by Bishop Reeves, uh, published in, in 1847. The uh, McCartans uh, exercised uh, control over the church. And if you want to know about the McCartans uh, and the McCartan period, then Sean McCartan is an, an excellent historian and has re researched uh, his family. And he published a history of the McCartans, uh, uh, bilingual in, in French and English, uh, and he's got a website. So uh, that, that's very useful telling you about, about the pre-plantation period. The McCartans um, <coughs> resisted all attempts to invade County Down. Uh, they resisted um, Edward Bruce, that's Robert Bruce's uh, brother, uh, they resisted the Normans, so uh, uh, 1453 they fought against the savages uh, who were, were Norman invaders. Uh, 1567 they fought against the uh, whites uh, in, in Killalay, <coughs> so those are, are the new uh, 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 English settlers. And 1601 they fought against Queen Elizabeth I uh, at, at the Battle of Kinsale. Now, all the invaders of Ireland uh, didn't make a great job of it. Eventually, they all got thrown out again, including the Normans. But that didn't happen with the Normans. That didn't happen with the Tudors. Uh, the Tudors um, successfully invaded Ireland, uh, defeated the McCartans. And this is the first time uh, when the McCartans have to forfeit land uh, to uh, Queen Elizabeth. So they forfeit land and County down. Uh, including uh, Dun Drum Dundrum Castle. So this is the beginning of the end of the Gaelic era. Uh, in 1607, you get the flight, flight of the Earls. Uh, you get uh, the Great O'Neills and the O'Donnells uh, leaving Ulster for Europe. Uh, notice the date 1607 uh, cropping up again. Now, the McCartans didn't go. Uh, they, they, they stayed uh, behind. And uh, if you look at uh, the, the wall of Old Mocker Drove, it's got a date stone on it, 1607. Uh, and there's, there's uh, an oral tradition that at that stage, yes, the uh, McCartans owned uh, the church, <coughs> but uh, they give a lease to the Burns. And it, it was in 1607 uh, that the Burns uh, rebuilt uh, 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 the church. So the archaeologists say it was rebuilt in 1607, and here's one story that the Burns uh, re rebuilt it uh, on behalf of the McCartans. And uh, there's another version of, of 1607. And this comes from an historian you've never heard of. And this is the Reverend Dr. Uh, James Armstrong of Balnehinch, a, a member of F First Balnehinch. Later became a non-subscriber and, and later moved uh, to a non-subscribing uh, congregation in Dublin. Uh, 
uh, famous in his own day, although we hardly know, we, we hardly hear about him nowadays. But if you go to um, the Belfast Harbour Commissioner's office and go into their uh, ballroom, at the bottom uh, there's a painting of, of Be Belfast in 1804. And there's an enlargement, bottom left, and it shows Dr. Armstrong. Um, <clears throat> And he's in company uh, with, with uh, Dr. James MacDonald, the founder of RVH. So, in his, in his day, uh, a well-known uh, and a professional historian. He was born in Balnage, 1780. He was educated at Rudemon by Dr. Moses Nielsen. He went on to become assistant to Dr. William Bruce at Belfast Royal Academy. Uh, he took an MA at uh, TCD and further education uh, uh, in Edinburgh. Minister of Strand Street, uh, non-subscribing church in Dublin. Got an honorary DD of, uh, at Geneva. When he died, uh, he was buried in Dublin. Uh, a large funeral attended by the Lord Chancellor. So uh, a prominent uh, and important figure. He wrote a history of the Presbyterian Church in Dublin. So uh, all, all, the, all the churches are in the Dublin area. He wrote a history of them. Now, he also wrote a manuscript history of uh, First uh, Balnehinch uh, Church, uh, which, is, which is available on the website. So it gives a lot of valuable information about uh, First Church uh, and, uh, uh, and about Old Mocker Droll. So this is what he tells us about Old Mockerdraw. Yes, it was rebuilt in, in 1607. And it was rebuilt with the intention of introducing a Protestant congregation. Because it's at this stage that, uh, that the, the uh, Gaelic forces are defeated. And Lord, Lord Chichester uh, wants to make uh, the churches Protestant, in, including Old Mockerdraw. Now, you can declare a church Protestant, but where do you get a congregation from and where do you get a clergyman from? So uh, <coughs> Chichester would have loved uh, to have had a congregation of Anglicans, uh, but they weren't available. But there were Presbyterians available. So as a compromise, uh, uh, Presbyterians were allowed uh, to occupy Old Mockerdroll under Church of Ireland auspices but still they were Presbyterians. And uh, the congregation wasn't large enough at that stage to have its own clergyman. So the visiting clergyman was the Reverend John Livingstone uh, of Kalinche. Now this is an un unusual arrangement where Presbyterians are allowed to, to occupy an Anglican church. Um, <clears throat> it, it, it comes about because you can't get any other variety of Protestants. And, and the same arrangement uh, uh, operated in Sainfield in 1658 and in uh, Kilinchy in, in 1630. Now it's unsatisfactory. The uh, Church of Ireland don't want the Presbyterians uh, in their churches. And as soon as they get an opportunity, uh, they'll uh, chuck, chuck them out again. Anyway, the Presbyterian congregation Balnehinch uh, was chased out by a rebellion which broke out in Ireland in 1641. And this was the English Civil War, the, the war between Charles I and Cromwell, spilling over into Ireland. So in 1641, uh, uh, Sir Philip and Sir Con McGuinness attacked Lisburn. Um, <clears throat> but they were beaten off by Sir George Rodden, who came over uh, from Leeds uh, to defend the Conway estate in Lisburn. And uh, uh, Dr. Armstrong says that as a result of that, uh, the Presbyterian congregation were driven out of Balnage in County Down. But uh, once, uh, once Cromwell uh, <coughs> arrived, uh, uh, County Down settled down again and the congregation re-establishes its, itself, not not uh, in um, not not an old mockered role, uh, but they established a new church, a new church of their own, about 1650 uh, in Balnehinch. Uh, this six, this 1641 period was uh, 
uh, very nasty and uh, uh, not pleasant uh, to explore. Uh, it was a period of massacres. So that, that was when you got the massacre at the Bloody Bridge in Newcastle and the massacre of, of Protestants uh, on the bridge at Porter Down. And then you got counter massacres uh, occurring uh, with, the, with Catholics <clears throat> being killed in an Island McGee at this site here on, on the causeway uh, out of Island McGee. Uh, the Presbyterians who had become established uh, in Old Mocker Droll uh, about 1607, um, they did, did quite well. Uh, here's one called William uh, McElrath, who lived in Ballamaglave. So he was attacked in uh, uh, 1641. He didn't get around to uh, make a, a complaint to the authorities until 1653. Uh, so he said that uh, the, uh, in Ballamaglave uh, he was attacked uh, by five bandits uh, who stabbed him with their knives and left him for dead and then robbed him of all his possessions. And his possessions included uh, 16 cows, a bull and two horses. So really, in the 40 years he'd, he'd been in Balnehinch uh, as a Scottish settler, uh, William had done quite well. Um, retribution for the rebellion uh, took a long time to arrive, but it came. Uh, so uh, Cromwell, first of all, had to defeat uh, the king's forces in England, and then he had to settle down. Uh, he had to settle Ireland and take control there. So it was the 1650s, uh, bef uh, or sorry, the late 1640s, uh, before Cromwell uh, sorted Ireland out. And then uh, uh, he began uh, pro prosecuting uh, the, the rebels at a commission at, in Carrickfergus in 1653. So uh, one of the McCartans had been involved in the, the rebellion, that was Patrick. So uh, that's Patrick's interrogation uh, uh, written down on the, on the left-hand side there. And it's signed by George Rodden and uh, Patrick McCartan. So again, the name uh, George Rodden pop, uh, pops up again. So Sir Philip O'Neill was hanged, <coughs> drawn and quartered in 1653 because of his, his attack on Lisbon. And, and uh, Patrick McCartan um, was hanged in Carrickfergus in 1653. Um, <coughs> when Cromwell arrived and, and decided to settle the place, uh, he intended uh, to confiscate land from those who had, who had rebelled. So if you want to know what land you're going to confiscate, first of all, uh, you, you have to uh, map the land. <coughs> so uh, he, uh, he got a surveyor called Sir William Petty to, to map all of Ireland. And this is the map of the Balanch area. So you'll, you'll see uh, two items here. The top red hand, uh, top red arrow, shows a church with a cross. Uh, so that's uh, Old Mocker Droll uh, up Crabtree Hill. And Petty said that uh, the church was no longer functional. Uh, it had walls and a roof, uh, but inside it, it was in dilapidation uh, due to all the fighting that had gone on. And then uh, in, in Ballamaglaive Itra, uh, bottom left, that's Ballamaglaive North, there was a thatched house. Uh, so that belonged to the McCartans, and that is the predecessor to Montalto House. Not the same building, but the same site. So um, uh, you see that Patrick McCartan, our pup, proprietor. Uh, he, he is recorded as the proprietor in 1655, but at that stage Patrick is actually dead and he's been executed. So uh, Patrick's uh, lands are about uh, to pass uh, to the new settlers and the lands around Balnehinch uh, settled, uh, uh, the lands around Balnehinch were passed to Sir George Rodden. Now although Rodden uh, owned the territory. Uh, his grip on it was, was kind of tenuous. Uh, he, he acquires ownership ab about 1657, 
But if you look at the number of tenants uh, he had in the district, there are, are very few Protestants. It's only in Ballykine and Mockernock that you have uh, a majority of Protestants. Uh, in Dunmore and Bally, uh, Ballylone, you've got a minority of Protestants, but in all the rest of the townlands, uh, it's a majority Irish uh, uh, population. So uh, he might have ownership and name, uh, but but uh, if he doesn't have a Protestant population, can can he control his territory? Well, he makes a good start. Uh, he erected a considerable town. Uh, it was a new built town, so this is what I, I told you that Balnens used to be just a crossroads, uh, but uh, Rodden laid out uh, new streets and, and a new marketplace. These lands by his care were become well inhabited, so he managed to attract new settlers from England and from Wales. Uh, so so that, that meant that he had uh, a larger Protestant population, which made him feel safer. He built two mills, and one of those mills, we know where it was, it's at the bottom of, um, uh, bottom of Church Road uh, uh, at Mill Bridge. Uh, he put the parish church in repair, which we're going to hear about, and he uh, established a large uh, uh, marketplace. So with um, Rodden owning the town and district, that means that Ownership of Old Mockardrol has now passed into Protestant uh, hands uh, temporarily because we're about to see it, it swapping about uh, between Protestant Catholic, Catholic Protestant, and during the Cromwell period, uh, it becomes probably Baptist. So looking at the clergy, um, <clears throat> 1622, uh, Thomas Johnson was installed as rector and uh, he provided the first uh, silver chalice uh, for the church and that chalice is still in existence and it's locked up in Can, Can Russell's safe uh, up in the present Mockard Road Church. Uh, <coughs> next uh, cler clergyman was Anthony Buckworth, an Englishman from Cambridge. Uh, he got chased out in 1641 but he came back 1654, this time working for Cromwell and was Cromwell's uh, clergyman in Newry. Another uh, Cromwellian clergyman installed at Old Mockardrol was Hugh Graffin. Um, uh, uh, Cromwell's, uh, the theology of Cromwell's supporters, I think the nearest to it would be Baptist. Uh, so Graffin, as well as being Baptist, uh, spoke Irish, so it was Cromwell's intention uh, that uh, Graffin preach uh, to the native Irish in, in Irish, uh, presumably to, trying to uh, uh, convert them to Protestantism. But uh, then Cr Cromwell died, uh, King Charles uh, was restored to the throne in 1660, so Graffin uh, had to trim his sails and instead of being Baptist he now became Anglican and he became rector of Mocker Droll um, uh, under the Church of Ireland. Great, great scarcity of clergy in the post-war period. Uh, so um, Graffin was appointed vicar of Mocker Droll, Sainfield, and Dramara and a, and a Hilt. Uh, so that would keep him busy. Uh, big changes come uh, uh, the, uh, the Williamite period uh, Lagarde Blacker uh, was the uh, uh, was the uh, vicar and Mother Droll didn't didn't last long. Died uh, at age 35, 1686. That was a great uh, fortunate escape because, of course, in 1689, uh, the uh, army of James II in, invaded County Down, and now you had Catholic ownership uh, of old old Mother Droll for for a, a period again. Uh, the, the Blackers refused uh, to accept control from James II and instead uh, supported uh, King William III. So this is when you got the Siege of Derry, uh, the uh, Battle of the Boyne, and the, the, Protestants, had, the Protestants fled Balnehinch in 1641, but now, but now they've, they fled uh, Balnehinch again. Uh, they either went to Coleraine uh, or to Derry, 
or they uh, went to, the, to uh, all the local fishing ports and took off for England or Scotland. Uh, Sir George Rodden was dead at this by, by then. He died in 1684. His son opposed the, the armies of uh, uh, King James. And um, the, uh, uh, his son, Sir Arthur Rodden, uh, who, fought the, who fought against King James's army at the break of Dromore in, in March 1689, but was defeated. Uh, so so for, for a period, you had Catholic uh, control of, of County Down. Uh, and you had Catholic control of, of Dublin and uh, Catholic control of the Parliament in Dublin. So King James uh, instituted a, a new Parliament in Dublin, uh, uh, composed of uh, Catholic uh, generals and Catholic aristocrats. And if you go to um, uh, Christ, Christ Church Cathedral in Dublin and go into the crypt, you'll see a shrine uh, and communion ware uh, that King James uh, donated uh, to Christ Church at the time uh, for ca Catholic worship uh, to, to, be, to be celebrated there. Now, let's see the composition of uh, his new Catholic Parliament. I told you that there were confiscations under Cromwell and under Queen Elizabeth uh, of uh, land from the Gaelic families, including the McGuinnesses and, and the McCartans. So installed uh, in King James's new Parliament uh, in Dublin, who did you find but the McGuinnesses? So you had Brian McGuinness in the Lords, and you have had Murta and Ever and Bernard uh, uh, in the Commons. And the first legislation uh, uh, proposed in this new uh, Dublin uh, House of Commons was, there, was that there would be an act of a tender. And that land which had been seized under Cromwell uh, <coughs> would be seized back uh, from the settlers uh, who, who had benefited who had benefited from those confiscations. Now, uh, you have McGuinnesses buried in Old Mahardroll, but you have Whites buried in Old Mahardroll. And the Whites uh, around Balnehinch were one of the principal uh, beneficiaries from the confiscations from the Irish, uh, uh, along with Mr. Tr uh, the Whites of Relay and Mr. Trail of Drumna Connor. So you've got a, an interesting situation in Mahardroll graveyard where you have uh, McGuinness burials and the McGuinnesses uh, and you have white burials and the McGuinnesses want uh, to reconfiscate uh, the, wh the white lands. Uh, this is, uh, uh, I'm going to look at a couple of graves uh, in detail. Uh, so this is uh, a, a grave, uh, and the, the coat of arms there uh, is the coat of arms uh, of the Armstrongs. Uh, so I talked about the whites, and the, the first bur there, are, there are burials uh, in this grave, uh, a succession of bur burials o over a period of uh, 200 years. So the first burials in here is uh, D David White of Bellamigaleave. So uh, he's one of the early settlers in, in Balnehenge. Uh, he's, he's one of the first beneficiaries of confiscated land. Um, <clears throat> second burial noted on the, on the tombstone is of John Strong. Uh, so it's John Strong who's the clergyman uh, who builds uh, the, I told, you, uh, uh, I told you there was a new church, a new Presbyterian church built in Balnehenge. He, he didn't build that, but he built the second one its replacement in, in 1751. So John Strong is, is buried uh, in, in this grave as well. And uh, then uh, 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 later on, there are Ar Armstrongs buried in this, in this grave. So um, after the Battle of the Boyne, uh, there was a century of peace uh, in County Down and uh, Old Mahardroll settled down uh, and settled down under um, uh, under Anglican ownership. So 1686, 
I told you that, that Lagarde Blacker died young, 1688, uh, just before the invasion uh, of uh, James II, the, the vicar was William Johnson. Uh, a, a, a local man born in Lisbon, educated in Trinity. Uh, so when King James invaded, uh, William Johnson fled Balnehinch. Uh, in 1694, uh, he was appointed to Garvache, uh, but uh, he didn't turn up to take up his post. Uh, he'd got a bad fright in 1689 and didn't think County Down was a safe place. But he was warned that he wouldn't be getting his salary, so uh, he turned up uh, and occupied the post in Garvachy, 1703. They had trouble filling the post in uh, Mahardroll. This is old Mahardroll. So uh, the Church of Ireland had to go to the local Presbyterians. Uh, they went to a Presbyterian family uh, down in Cloch, uh, a, a family called Williamson. So they appointed John Williamson, uh, a Presbyterian, but they appointed him as the rector uh, of Old Mocker Uh the, the family were uh, Presbyterian, and his nephew and, and his brother were Presbyterian ministers at Cloch. But uh, he ser served 29 years uh, uh, in, in Old Mocker Droll. He was succeeded by... Uh, William Skeffington, again a local man born in County Armagh, uh, educated at, at Trinity. Uh, good long incumbency, uh, was there for 18 years. Uh, succeeded by James Hanna, was there for 11 years. This is still old Mocker uh, Then came uh, Patrick Kenney, uh, a, a Dubliner, educated at Trinity. And then the longest incumbency of the lot uh, from 1763 to 1816, the Reverend James Ford, uh, born in Drogheda, uh, educated at Trinity. And it's, it's worth looking at, at uh, James Ford's uh, career. I told you that the first chalice uh, was provided by uh, Thomas, uh, T uh, Thomas Johnson, 1622. It's still around. Uh, 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 Can uh, Canon Russell uh, still, still has it. So just imagine that uh, for 400 years, uh, all the births, marriages, uh, deaths, funerals, uh, Sunday services were celebrated in this little church uh, on the top of a hill, up a little, up a little narrow road. Uh, <coughs> uh, and if you, if you wanted to go to church, you had to go, go down Church Road and climb up uh, Crabtree Hill uh, in, in all weathers. Uh, we, know one <laughs> we know one detail about that, that old church is that it had a, a Bible. Uh, after the Reformation, uh, English monarchs wanted the Bible to be uh, available to be read by everybody. Uh, so uh, uh, Bibles were provided in the church but just in case anybody tried to steal it, uh, the Bible was, was chained to the wall. So old, old Mocker Droll had a chained Bible. I showed you the um, <coughs> Armstrong grave and I told you a bit about it. Now I'm, now I'm going to tell you a bit more. Uh, I was first, first there in 2006 and then I went back in 2017. And, <coughs> and you see the a difference. Um, uh, th this church, uh, th uh, th this cemetery is largely unused uh, and, if you, and if, if you don't have constant maintenance uh, of a cemetery then uh, sooner or later it gets covered in ivy. So if you wanted to see the Armstrong uh, uh, tombstones you, you can't anymore because they're, they're, they're coated in ivy. So just to make sure uh, you know which grave I'm talking about, uh, I've uh, delineated it there with those uh, buff colored bars. Uh, that, that's, where, that's where it is. It's, it's a grave uh, which is inside uh, the body of the old church. All the important people in Balnehinge of the period were buried inside the church walls uh, once the church was abandoned. Now, over the period of two centuries, there are multiple burials. 
And when you examine the individuals who are buried, you're really getting a, a history of the American uh, and the French revolutions uh, and, the, and the 1798 rebellion. I've told you about the first burial uh, in, in, this, in this grave, and that is David White. Uh, so he came from a Williamite family and he benefited uh, from uh, the confiscations uh, f from, from the Irish. The second uh, uh, burial in this grave, not recorded on the tombstone, but recorded by Dr. Armstrong. <coughs> uh, the, the second burial uh, is of the uh, Reverend James McAlpin. Uh, who was minister of uh, the Ballenhenge Presbyterian Congregation from 1713 uh, to, to 1732. Now, I said that Sir George Rawdon didn't have many Protestants uh, uh, to rely on in, in the Ballenhenge district, but after 1690, uh, County Down was flooded with Presbyterians uh, coming from Scotland. There was, there was a famine in Scotland at the time, uh, so the Scottish Presbyterians knew that that County Down was now safe uh, after King William's victory. So large numbers of them arrived uh, in, in County Down and in Balnehenge. And those large numbers are reflected in the number of births. Uh, uh, Dr. Armstrong uh, has preserved the records of the number of births uh, in the Presbyterian congregation. So uh, there were some years where Mr. McAlpine uh, had to uh, cope with uh, uh, 90, uh, 90 baptisms. Uh, so uh, he, he was a busy man. More about Mr. McAlpin. Before he was appointed to Balnehinch, he ran a very famous school in, in Killalay. Uh, it was a long time before you had, uh, you didn't have state education in Ireland until the Victorian period. So any, any education, Prior to that, had to be a, a private enterprise, uh, generally run uh, by the churches. So the Presbyterians were very keen that, the, uh, that their young men be educated, particularly to enter the ministry. So uh, James McAlpin was uh, appointed to run a school in Killalay, and his funding came from the Hamiltons uh, of Killalay Castle, who were Presbyterians. So one of uh, McAlpin's most famous uh, pupils was uh, Francis Hutchison. Uh, uh, Francis Hutchison, born, born in Drummolig, uh, the most famous County Down Presbyterian ever. Uh, he became uh, uh, Professor of Moral Philosophy at Glasgow University. Now philosophers can come up with some very explosive ideas. So his idea was that if he wanted to run government, uh, the best government was one which procures the greatest, greatest happiness for the greatest numbers. Now that was revolutionary and seditious, and that was not how uh, the that was not how uh, governments were run at the time. Not in Europe, uh, not in England, not in Ireland. Uh, governments then were run on the principle of the greatest happiness of the least number uh, at the expense of the uh, great, greatest number. So this revolutionary doctrine of his uh, it was, um, was taken to heart uh, in America and, it, uh, and uh, Hutchison is credited uh, being among those who triggered uh, the American Revolution uh, where the Americans uh, threw off the old order and said, we will not be governed by uh, kings, we will not be governed by bishops, uh, we will not be governed uh, by uh, aristocrats or, or landlords. Uh, we will have a, a democratic system uh, where everybody has a vote and the, uh, you have the happiness of the, of the greatest number. So uh, who was responsible for Hutchison's education? Well, uh, none other than a, a Balnehenge clergyman. To give you an idea of the old system, uh, the landlords of Balnehenge uh, um, not only owned uh, Montalto House, but they owned Moore Castle, they owned Donington Hall in Leicestershire, they owned Moore House in Dublin, and at one stage they owned Loudon Castle uh, in, in, in Scotland. 
So this is an example of the greatest happiness of the few. Uh, and uh, the few are very wealthy and can afford all these big houses, but uh, they can afford their wealthy lifestyle at the expense of the people at the bottom uh, who uh, have, have to work hard and have very little and uh, uh, have, have no cushion against poverty. So this is the system uh, that Francis Hutchison uh, aims to overthrow and uh, in America uh, he succeeded in overthrowing it. The third uh, person buried in the Armstrong grave, as I told you, is the Reverend uh, 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 John Strong, who built uh, um, uh, uh, what is now First, first uh, Presbyterian uh, in Balnage in, in 1751. So um, I've got the population figures for 1831, uh, that, the, the, the pie chart, bottom right. So uh, by that stage, uh, the Presbyterian, uh, Presbyterian population in Balnehinch is about half of the local population. Uh, it's, it's still a strong uh, Catholic population of 29%, but the uh, Ch Church of Ireland, they're lagging behind at uh, 20%. Now, <clears throat> new revolutionary ideas uh, were abroad in the, in the late 1700s, uh, stirred up by, by the like of Francis Hutchison. And they were taken to heart in Balnehinch, and they were taken to heart by John Armstrong, and he is number four uh, of the people who are buried uh, in, in the Armstrong grave. So here's a painting of a parade in Belfast in, in 1791. And this is not the 12th, uh, because the 12th hadn't been invented. Uh, the 12th didn't come along until uh, 1795. This is a parade celebrating the French Revolution. And the banner doesn't feature King William, it uh, features the Bastille and the fall of the Bastille uh, and uh, France being liberated from rule by, by, by kings and lords and uh, flying from the market house uh, in, in High Street in Belfast uh, is the French tricolor uh, and the uh, American stars and stripes. So uh, in, County Down, in County Down very dangerous seditious ideas were abroad that in, in, why, don't, why don't we copy uh, the French and the Americans. Why don't we throw off rule by the king uh, and, by, and by the landlords? And uh, uh, so, so this, uh, th this demonstration in Belfast was um, attended by John Armstrong and uh, John Armstrong uh, uh, led w one, of the, one of the biggest uh, uh, contingents. Uh, Balanch Captain Armstrong uh, his contingent was 104, uh, one, uh, the, the largest contingent uh, in that parade. Um, <clears throat> this attracted the, uh, his adherence to revolutionary and seditious principles, attracted the attention uh, of the authorities. Um, those demonstrations in Belfast were banned. Uh, when it came to the Battle of Balnehinch, uh, it, it was known that Armstrong, who, who owned Armstrong's Inn, uh, it's long since demolished, but its, its site uh, is uh, the, the old inn on the corner of the square. The authorities knew that Armstrong had uh, allowed the United Irish men uh, to hold meetings uh, in his uh, inn. And there, there's, the, there's the records uh, of the, the minutes of a meeting in, in 1797. So uh, Armstrong uh, paid dearly uh, for entertaining the United Irish men. When General Nugent uh, burned down Balnehinch, uh, Armstrong's Inn was one of, one of the first buildings uh, to be burned. Coming to the last uh, uh, burial uh, in, in the Armstrong grave, uh, it's, uh, the, the burial was of the Reverend William Crozier, uh, come 1830, there was a split in the Presbyterian Church and it split into uh, um, the General Assembly uh, and the, the non-subscribers. 
So Redemon at that, at that stage had been General Assembly, but then it split, became non-subscriber, and you had Dromachlis uh, founded uh, uh, as, a, uh, as a break-off, and it, it adhered to the General Assembly. And you got this big split uh, uh, and two different moderators. So you had Henry Cook for the General Assembly and you had Henry Montgomery uh, for the non-subscribers. Uh, and it was one of the uh, uh, Croziers uh, who, who are related to the Balnange Armstrongs. It was one of, one of the Croziers who wrote a biography of the, uh, the Reverend Henry Montgomery. So uh, that's the fifth burial in the Armstrong grave. So uh, if you look at, the, at the, those who are buried there, you're looking at the history of the French Revolution, the American Revolution, uh, and you're looking at the history of the, of the split uh, in the Presbyterian Church. Now, I've been a bit unfair in concentrating on Presbyterians. Let's, let's look uh, at the uh, Church of Ireland. And I said that the Reverend James Ford had a very long tenure uh, in Old Mocker Droll. So he too is buried uh, with it within the bounds of the church, uh, and that's his tombstone up, up at the chancel. And lo and behold, uh, Canon Russell has got a picture of him uh, in, in the vestry. Uh, I, think, I think that's a, pho a photograph of a painting. So um, here's... Here's another painting, a painting of the Battle of Balnage. And right planked in the middle of it is, is Mohardrol Parish Church. Uh, so uh, the, the Reverend Ford uh, certainly uh, had an adventurous time. Uh, during the, the battle, uh, 63 houses were burned down in Balnage. Uh, and 69 uh, were damaged, uh, including the uh, churches. Uh, uh, churches and the other, other houses were, were wrecked and looted. Uh, so the, uh, Mr. Ford didn't have his sorrows to seek. <laughs> look look how, uh, how long a career he had and what happened during that career. Um, he was around in 1763, so he would have seen the outbreak of the American War of Independence. He would have seen the French Revolution uh, and uh, the decapitation of, of Louis. He would have seen the 25-year uh, war with Napoleon. He would have seen the 1798 rebellion. He would have seen that okay because it, uh, half of it occurred in, in his own church cemetery. Um, uh, uh, he, his church and, uh, survived the Battle of Balnage. And then he saw the end of the war with France. Uh, the, the year before he died, he would have seen uh, England uh, celebrating the victory uh, over Napoleon uh, at, the, at the Battle of Waterloo. So again, an awful lot of history tied up with uh, one tombstone uh, in, in Old Mohardrol. The Old Mohardrol was a, a, shared, a shared church. Uh, you had um, uh, Catholics and Protestants uh, worshipping there together. So uh, the, the Catholics arrived and had a service earlier on Sunday mornings and, the, and then the Protestants uh, would, would arrive later and, and have their service. Um, the same arrangement was in place uh, at, at, at Lochan Island. In the old churches I showed you that were, that were, that were occupied by the, the McCartans. Now the arrangement in Lochan Island broke down one morning uh, when uh, there was a downpour and the Catholic congregation uh, decided to stay in the church uh, while the Protestant congregation were assembling outside. Uh, so that meant the uh, Protestants couldn't get in and they took the downpour. Uh, so the Protestants were very angry about that. And then the Protestants took off and established a church of their own uh, this time in, in uh, Seaford. And in, reven in revenge, the, uh, uh, the, uh, the landlord of Seaford took the roof uh, off, the, off the, the Lochan Island Church. So it wasn't always a sm smooth arrangement. Uh, if the church was shared Protestant and Catholic, that meant you had a shared cemetery. 
so you had uh, Catholic burials as well as Protestant ones. Burials are still going on uh, in, in that cemetery. Uh, so uh, if you have a grave there, then from generation to generation, uh, uh, that those, those graves still accept burials. Uh, here are some pr uh, pro uh, prominent uh, Catholic burials. 1704, uh, Father John O'Burn, who was the PP for Kilmore, Sainfield and Mardroll, uh, resident of Cravey Argon. Uh, he's buried here. Father John Maguire, PP of Lower Ards, uh, buried in Old Mardroll, uh, a local man uh, uh, born in Mardrolone. Uh, Father Hugh Green, uh, born in uh, Drumna Conacher, uh, was studying in Paris, uh, got chased out in 1793, appointed uh, PP of St. 181, and it's he who built uh, St. Field Chapel. Uh, he's buried in Old Mother in 1834. Uh, Father Abraham McNamara, cur curate in Achadurg, uh, and his parents. Uh, are buried in Old Mahardrol, and if you get up close, you can you can read uh, those details on the on the tombstone. So a, a very interesting shared church and shared uh, cemetery. I said that the Presbyterians built a church in Balnehens. The Presbyterians originally were in Old Mahardrol, uh, but they built their own church, not in not up Crabtree Road but in Balnehinch, on what became Meeting House Street. Uh, the first church there was built about, about 1650, uh, replaced uh, in, in, in 1750. So the Presbyterians didn't tolerate walking up uh, to Crabtree Hill on a Sunday. Uh, they wanted a, a church in the centre of town. So eventually the arrangement broke down for the Church of Ireland as well. And, and they didn't want to walk all the way to, uh, to Crabtree Road. So um, Lord, uh, Lord Bora had built a new church uh, on Church Street, and he built it as a private chapel for uh, Montalto. And to access the chapel from the Montalto estate, uh, there was a bridge across the river, and you can see that bridge there, uh, uh, bottom right, it's, it's gone now. And if you go down the Riverside Walk and look from there at the church, that's, that's a good, that's a, a fine view of the church. Uh, so I, th I think the intention always was that the church be viewed not from Church Road, uh, but the, be the best view of, of the church uh, would be from the Montalto estate. So uh, the, uh, Lord Moore then decided that... Um, his, his, his new church on Church Road uh, should, should be the church for the town and for the Anglican congregation. And they moved down in 1772. Um, but uh, uh, some, of, some, of the, some of the congregation said, no, we want to stay in Old Mother Drove. I mean, that's where our parents worshipped. That's where our grandparents worshipped. No, we, we, we're just going to stay where we are. So uh, Lord Moore didn't leave them with a choice. He told William Dornan to take the thatch of the, of the old church in Mahardrol, uh, and then that forced the, all, all of the congregation uh, to come down uh, to Church Street. Um, Lord Moore thought that uh, Balnehinch was... Uh, originally he'd lived in Moira, but 1760 he moved to Balnehinch he thought the Balnench was nicely settled now. The last trouble uh, had been in, in 1690. So Balnench would be a nice, peaceful place, he thought, uh, when he built Montalto. How wrong he was. Uh, um, 1798, uh, the uh, uh, rebellion broke out. And a lot of the fighting happened within the Montalto domain. And a lot of the fighting happened around his new church on Church Street. So looking at this map here, uh, the rebels uh, uh, assembled on Eden of Andy Hill and on Montalto on the left-hand side. General Monroe, when uh, he launched two attacks uh, on, the, on the British Army, he launched one attack across the river and up uh, Dremore Street. He launched another attack 
uh, th uh, through uh, across the river and through Mahardrol uh, Cemetery. That's Mahardrol Church. You see Mark Martin Red there. So uh, the church had moved uh, down from Crabtree Hill, but it got quite lively uh, in, it, in its new location. Uh, still speaking about old Mucker Droll, um, during, there was fighting in Balnehenge on the 9th of June, and uh, 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 the Castlewell and Yeomen were bringing a prisoner through Balnehenge. Uh, they were attacked by the locals and the prisoner was rescued. The yeomen fired uh, on the locals and they killed a shopkeeper, uh, Richard Cordner of, of, of Balnehenge. Uh, Cordner had a shop uh, where Iceland is now. So this is uh, one of the uh, recorded casualties uh, of the fighting in Balnehenge. Uh, Cordner is buried inside the uh, old church uh, you see, you see, I've, I've marked uh, his tombstone uh, in red. So the tombstone lies flat. It doesn't say he was killed in the fighting, but it's plain uh, uh, that he was uh, because the date is the um, June uh, the 9th, uh, 1798. So he was killed uh, at, age, at age 48. Um, there are a lot of social problems uh, confronting uh, the um, Mokhardrol uh, vestry. Um, local government uh, in, the, in the 1800s lay, county local government lay with the grand jury uh, which met in Downpatrick. Town local government lay with the Church of Ireland vestries. Now, although these were Church of Ireland entities, um, all Town lands and, and all denominations were represented on the, on the vestry. So it was de democratic uh, lo local government. It was held under Church of Ireland auspices and on Church of Ireland uh, premises, uh, but uh, all, all town lands uh, were represented. And if you work your way through this table here, uh, you, you can see all the, the, the local town lands uh, have a, a representative. So uh, you had, there were two Presbyterian churches in Balnage at the, uh, by 183, and uh, a clergy, both, both the clergy are here. Uh, the Church of Ireland uh, uh, vicar, he's, he's there, and uh, the uh, uh, Catholic priest, Fa Father Alexander McCoy, he's represented. And there was ca Catholic representation uh, among the town lands, so uh, from uh, Drum Snad, uh, you had a uh, Brian Davy, uh, 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 well known Catholic name. The Church of Ireland uh, was responsible, if no one else took responsibility, uh, the Church of Ireland was responsible for orphans uh, and for uh, the dead. So if nobody else would, would if, if, a, if a beggar died on, on your hands in Balnage, uh, and there was nobody to bury him, the Church of Ireland became responsible for the burial. So here, here are the records for Marwood for 1815. And you see that during the year, they had to bury nine paupers uh, and at, at a cost, uh, cost of uh, one pound, two and ninepence. They were responsible for orphans. Um, if um, the... <coughs> Quite often when the sexton turned up to Mockard Roll in the mornings, uh, he would find a basket on the church door and in the basket would be a newborn infant. So a uh, young woman had become pregnant. Uh, she w was unmarried. Uh, she, uh, she gave birth to the child, but uh, she couldn't tell the family and she couldn't keep the child. Uh, uh, the, the family would, would ostracize her uh, if, if she had a child out, outside marriage. So she brought the child in a basket and left it on, on the doorstep of the, of the church. Uh, so this happened uh, frequently in Balnage uh, in 1815 and I'm sure in, pre in previous cent centuries. So the expenses in, 715, in 1815 were for four pounds, 12, 12 shillings, 
uh, and a, a, a penny halfpenny. So that is an awful lot of orphans uh, that Machardrol uh, had to deal with. And it got worse. Uh, quite often the section would, would turn up in the morning and he would notice that a, gra a grave had been disturbed. And so somebody had dug the grave. Uh, so he would investigate and uh, dig the excavation. And do you know what he'd find? He'd find a dead baby uh, re uh, buried in the grave. So, uh, same circumstances, uh, uh, an extramarital pregnancy. Uh, the mother, in desperation, uh, had to get rid of the body. So, did the child die naturally or was the child smothered? And an inquest were held on, on the body and uh, the uh, determination was that uh, the, the child had been smothered. So, uh, T terrible situations are arriving, are arising at, at uh, Mahardroll. Balnehenge wasn't the only town in Ireland uh, which had this kind of problem. Uh, <clears throat> you had loads of what were called foundlings in Balnehenge. Uh, about 2,000 uh, uh, turned up annually uh, in Ireland. And they were uh, sent off to the foundling hospital in Dublin. Now, if you don't look after your own kids, you needn't expect anybody else to look after them. And 80% of the kids who were sent to the Foundling Hospital in Dublin uh, died. Uh, and because, because the care was so disgraceful, uh, the hospital was closed down uh, in 1835. As if, things, as if things weren't bad enough, um, Balnehenge had, had a problem with uh, body snatchers. If you go to Clifton House, uh, you see the uh, 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 display board there. And then at the bottom of the display board, uh, they have an old musket. And that was the gun which was held by Clifton House to guard their cemetery. Uh, because uh, the uh, grave robbers uh, tried to snatch bodies uh, from the cemetery. And the same thing went on in Balnehinch. If you go to Old Mahardroll, there's a strong uh, masonry en entrance. Uh, and then uh, on, t on top of that entrance, there was a wooden tower. So after, uh, after an interment, the relatives uh, stayed uh, for a couple of days in the tower uh, to watch for the bot body snatchers. And uh, the two body snatchers who were busy in Balnenge was uh, John McComb of, of uh, Meeting Street and Hugh Quinn of Ballamaglave. Now, uh, they dug up the bodies in Mohardrol and brought them down to Balnenge town. Uh, all those houses on the left-hand side of High Street, uh, the ground falls away steeply, uh, at the back down towards the river. So those houses are very deep cellars, deep cold cellars. Uh, so the two Balnehenge uh, body snatchers brought uh, the bodies down and stored them uh, in, in the cellars below uh, what at that stage was uh, uh, Samuel Watson uh, Kiernan's uh, um, hardware store. Um, the problem was widespread. Like I said, it happened uh, at uh, Cl Clifton Street Cemetery. Uh, so Clifton Street, they installed a coffin guard. Uh, so uh, before, before the body was, was put in the ground, uh, a steel guard was put on it. Uh, and then uh, that, that guard was kept on until uh, decomposition uh, ha had taken place and the body had lost its value. Talking about the value, in 1760, the College of Surgeons made it mandatory for, for surgeons to learn their trade by dissecting bodies. Uh, so that, that provided a, a, a source of income for the resurrection men. So uh, in 1811, uh, they would get one pound 10 for a child's body, four guineas for an adult's, and then uh, Inflation took hold, and by 1832, an adult body would uh, cost £9.11. 
the trade sp spread to Ireland. Um, so how did you get a body from Ireland uh, to uh, Great Britain? Well, you packed it in a barrel of brandy and exported it by, by sea uh, via, via Liverpool. In 1828, Burke and Hare in Edinburgh decided to make life, life easier for themselves. Uh, they didn't bother digging up bodies. They went out and murdered a few people. Uh, um, in fact, they, they murdered six, 16 people and got uh, £10 a time for the, for the corpses. So this, this carry-on stopped in 1832 uh, with the Anatomical Act uh, when it, it became legal uh, to do, donate a body. Um, after the uh, uh, new Mockardrol was opened in 1772, uh, burials continued in old Mockardrol. Uh, so you can imagine the, the this is this is the horse drawn hearse of the time. So you can imagine that hearse uh, working its way up the hill uh, to uh, Crabtree Hill, and it did good breaks uh, on on the way back down. Uh, I, the burial cert certainly continued. Uh, here's one here, uh, which which occurred uh, during World War One. Uh, Private Patrick Medine of Church Street had been uh, injured. Uh, came back and was hospitalised uh, in Belfast, in, in a military hospital. Uh, <clears throat> but uh, he'd been wounded in 1916, and then eventually he died uh, as a result of those wounds in Belfast. Uh, so he was he was buried uh, not in St Patrick's in Balmhinch, uh, where he could have been, uh, but he was buried in the Medine grave in Old Mockardrol. Uh, he was offered a military funeral, uh, but the family said, no, uh, we'll, we'll uh, just, just have a private funeral. I'm getting towards the end here. Uh, there's a lot of interest uh, in uh, cemeteries. So uh, catalogues have been published uh, of the cemeteries in Uri, uh, Banbridge, Downpatrick, uh, and uh, uh, Clifton Street uh, Cemetery in Belfast. And those books have done what I've done. They've, they've uh, picked graves and then they've gone through the history of, of the residents of those graves. So it's not just a, a matter of recording the tombstones, it's digging out all, all the history. So um, there has been renewed interest in, in uh, Old Mockardrol uh, with uh, John Ard uh, a resident of Don Drum, former resident of Balnehenge, uh, uh, interest from Dr. William Rolson, a very fine historian, and interest from Patrick Clark, uh, 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 <coughs> a councillor at one time who drew uh, council attention uh, to Old Mockardrol. So I've described the contents of two, two or three graves, but uh, if uh, if somebody put their mind to it and surveyed all the graves in Old Mockardrol, uh, then you could end up uh, with a catalogue such, such as have been written for the others. So that's all I'm going to tell you. I'd like to thank uh, all the people who down the years uh, have provided me uh, with information uh, to pass on to you. I hope you've enjoyed that.